Okay, we're recording so we can share this. Um, but I, I just want to um, say a few words about this. You know, we've been meeting together since September. We've been learning um, so much about the scope and the depth of racism. And the news just continues to um, dismay <clears throat> us with the killing of black people. And it just felt like we keep asking, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And it just felt like we needed to do something. And the most powerful thing we as people of faith can do is pray. So it just seemed like this was a good thing for us to do at this time to um, just add our prayers tonight for um, help. Um, for God's healing and for God's wholeness in this situation. And also want to remind everyone that um, Denise reminded us this past week that honest conversation is good. Um, you know, it's a non-judgment zone. You know, we feel, feel free to um, speak and share and we will learn and grow together. And so um, don't, think, well, I'm not saying anything because I might say something wrong. Um, that's how we learn and that's how we grow. And so we can tell each other when we question what each other says. That's, that's honest conversation too. But just want to start by saying that. Denise, did you want to add anything to that? No, fine. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to start with the music video, if I can get it up there, and I may not be able to, so I may have to uh, share my screen and ask Cassie if she could. It's the Lift Every Voice and Sing by The Balm in Gilead, and it's a February 2009, so you'll see it ends with the president, which is Obama at the time. So let me do screen sharing. <clears throat> it's the song and it has uh, pictures that go with it in the video. Are you finding it? I have it if you need me to take over. Yeah, it. I shared screen, I think. Okay.
Thank you, Cassie. Any comments on that before we move on? It's awesome. Wow. Very powerful. Absolutely. And obviously very emotional to Denise. At this, you okay, Denise? Mm -hmm. At this time, um, we'd like to ask Diane to read her poem. And um, if you could give us the title and read your poem, Diane. This I shared um, some weeks ago with our group and most of you, I think, were on it. And um, the, the, the scripture that prompted it was from Matthew 25. Lord, when did we see you? I tell you the truth, when you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. So can we pray together? Awesome God, hear our prayer. Lord, when did we see you? We see you now. You were looking right at us. Don't let us look away. You were looking at us through the eyes of black people killed by police violence. You were looking at us through the eyes of young scholars left to language because of inadequate schools. You were looking at us through the eyes of families who want equal opportunity to rent or to buy housing. You are looking at us through the eyes of those passed over for hiring or promotion because of employer bias. You are looking at us through the eyes of those who are wasting in prisons due to overt racism. Lord, when did we see you? You were looking right at us. Don't let us look away. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise, or Diane. And any, any uh, after each um, person, there'll be a time for comments if you would like to make any. So <clears throat> any, any comments on that, feel free. I just think it's such a powerful piece. I would, we have something called uh, Urban League Sundays. And of course, with COVID, we haven't had one in a while, but it's a very moving and stirring day for us. And I would love that if we have it again, that we're able to borrow Diane's poem and have that read. Absolutely. So that, <laughs> that, would yeah. be my, that would be my honor. Yeah. I, just, I just wrote it from my heart and um, whatever, however it, it's used is, is fine with me. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look into it and share it. That's my favorite scripture passage, uh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And uh, that's very well done, Diane, uh, because it does highlight that it's more than just food, water, clothing. Um, it's, it's much more than that. It's education. It's um, competitive advantages that need to be shared fairly. Uh, it's about living in a world where uh, we live as a community. <laughs> rather than as uh, individuals. And so we really did appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, at this time, we've asked Mary um, to say the name. We thought it was important tonight in our prayer vigil to remember the names of those who have been killed recently in memory of them, but also in honor of all those names we don't know. That there was no iPhone or body cam or surveillance camera to know and to report and to reveal. Um, and you know, throughout the years, just the number of, of people, black people that have been killed. So Mary, we'll turn this over to you. And I would like to 
um, as I read them, I wanted to be part of a prayer. So I'm going to start with prayer and then read the names and then we'll um, close the prayer. I just thought that was appropriate. So let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we come together to pray for all our black brothers and sisters who were killed by police. We know that you grieve their loss along with their families and each one of us. As the names of some of those are read, we remember them. We mourn their loss and we celebrate their life. Antoine Rose. William Green. Manny Ellis. Brianna Taylor. Daniel Prude. Michael Ramos. Sean Reed. George Floyd. Tony McDade. David McAtee. Carlos Carson. Rayshard Brooks. Dijon Kizzy. Jonathan Price. Marcella Stinnett, Sincere Pierce, AJ Crooms, AC Goodson, Andre Hill, Angelo Quinto, Vinny Belmonte, Patrick Warren Sr., Marvin Scott III. Dante Wright, Andrew Brown Jr., Micaiah Bryant. Let me God, you've heard all those names and you know them. You know their hearts, you know their stories, you, you know the pain that they suffered. We know that they are in the palm of your hand and we rejoice. And we just thank you and praise you for all the ways in which you protect us. And we ask for further protection upon our neighborhoods. We ask all we thank on Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Welcome. It, it occurred to me when you were reading of the, the hole in people's lives because of their deaths. And that was just from 20, 2020 to 2021. Wow. Mm. Antoine Rose, because we know Antoine Rose, but all the others are just from 2020 and 2020. Mm -hmm. And three of them were just in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I think what, what struck me was uh, how many names I hadn't heard. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that short a period of time to have so many yeah. to, uh, to be uh, to die so violently. Yeah. And when you think of the contributions that they might have made had they lived to society, had they just been given a chance to be alive longer in the world, we're, we all were of, have lost what they could have given um, to, to their, just even in the smaller scale to their families, to their children, to their spouses and friends, and then in the greater community, you know. And it always reminds me of what um, George Floyd's daughter told President Biden. My father's changed the world, you know, and how many of the others have changed the world through what they, you know, through the loss of their life. Exactly. Well, our prayer tonight is that indeed the world will change. Mm -hmm. It would have been better had they not lost their lives and changed the world uh, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and it is, uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that uh, Judy mentioned early on is that, you know, we know about these people because others have told us about them and taken pictures and videos of the events. And we have these, these body cameras for the police now. And, you know, 
that's just from 2020 and 2021. We're only halfway through 2021. And, you know, think about all those days in the past. I mean, we, we watched uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. You know, look at what was happening in the South when uh, the freedom marchers were, uh, were marching through Montgomery and, and Selma and how violent uh, it was then. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, it doesn't seem to have changed a lot at least uh, from my perspective, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. And even before there was the ability to document visual in a way back before they had the passed down by word of mouth, but so much of that people were just went unnoticed, un, unnamed. Who was the uh, the woman who wrote and sang the song "Strange Fruit"? Was that Billie Holiday? Yes. Uh huh. That was you know that was a similar um, uh, statement of sorts. Uh, you know, basically in song depicting these types of atrocities that were going on mm -hmm. around the country. Yeah, according to the story, it was based on her, one of her first forays in the deep south, because she, she was in Baltimore and actually saw body, a body swinging in the wind from a lynching. And that was her, you know, she wrote that, that song in tribute to those who have been lynched. Yeah. <laughs> I know uh, my grand Verlesia, um just discovered the Emmett Till case and it's affected her greatly, mm -hmm. you know, because she was like, he's, he was innocent. He was only 14 and they took his life and the things that had, you know, they had done to him and his body. And she, you know, the guys literally confessed to it and still were found innocent. And she just, she couldn't wrap her mind around that. Like, how do you, how does that happen in this world? Like, and so it's it's been tough explaining things to her why you know how things like that happen and why they happen and you know it's a, it's 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 discussions that none of us look forward to having. Mm -hmm. how, how old is she, Denise? She's nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. 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 So you know, it's explaining because it's it, it it everybody walks with me. There's no way to have the discussion without feeling less than. You know, and even though you try your best to say, well, you know, it was the times, it was this, but then it's, you can't say that anymore because it's still happening. You know, it's yeah. still, so. Yep. It's like a different type of lynching, you know, now. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's more, it's, it's almost as legal, you know, because it was legal. It was, there was no, there's no ramifications. And I told her, I said, one day we'll sit down and we'll do the, the uh, story, the Black Wall Street story. And I said, but we're going to do it together. We'll have that conversation because that one is a, another very hard hitting story. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't want her to discover that one by herself either. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> I think at this time, we're going to pray against um, systemic racism and white supremacy culture. And I use the Amos 5 passage uh, verses 21 through 24, where God says, um, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. So God saying to the people of Israel and through them to us of what where God's heart is and what matters to God, um, and that is justice and righteousness. So what I've done is um, some different categories of systemic racism and a white supremacy culture. And so I'm going to um, just 
briefly mention something about each of these topics. And we will end with, I'll say, God, we pray against this. And your response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. So the first um, category, and at the end, if there are other categories you want to add, feel free. <clears throat> but the first category that I listed was our legal justice system. And we, this past year, looked at the Harvard Law Study of the legal justice system, where they concluded it was a three-year study that was commissioned by a judge who wanted to know why there was a higher rate of Black and Brown people in jail. And they concluded after study and looking at the offenses, the charges, the sentencing, studying all these cases that the only conclusion they could come to was racism. Said black and Latinx people were detained at a higher rate, searched more often, charged more often, found guilty more often and given longer uh, sentences for incarceration. And so um, Lord, God, we pray against this racism. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayer. And the next category I listed was housing, the racism in housing, home ownership, and high quality affordable rental housing are critical tools for wealth building and financial well being in the United States. But across the country, historic and ongoing displacement, exclusion, and segregation continues to prevent people of color from obtaining and retaining their own homes and accessing safe, affordable housing. God, we want to pray against this racism. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. The next category I listed were financial institutions. Racialized patterns are also reflected in banks, historic and present day practices around redlining, whereby banks extend less credit and or higher cost credit to communities of color. And of course, in every one of these categories, there's so much more to the topic, but this is just um, a highlight of the, the racism that exists for this topic. So God, we want to pray against this racism. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our, our prayers. prayers. Um, the next one is racism in education. Racism exists in education, in implicit bias in the classroom, and in the educational system. Segregation of communities leads to disparities in resources and undereducated students. Racism within schools has often created a school to prison pipeline for people of color. Lord, we want to pray against this racism. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our, our prayer. prayer. The next is racism in our healthcare system. Racial discrimination permeates the healthcare system. This has a negative consequence for both patients and healthcare workers, leading to higher risks of illness and, in some cases, lower standards of care for people of color. The COVID-19 pandemic draws attention to this. It is estimated that black people were, are three and a half times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white people. Similarly, the risk of death within the Latinx population is nearly twice that of the white population. God, we want to pray against this racism in healthcare. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Our prayer. Transportation. Racism has shaped public transit and it's riddled with inequities from funding, planning, and infrastructure to design and policing. Many transit agencies essentially have built two systems with different standards for choice riders and dependent riders. 
And that is to say white writers and black writers um, from the various communities. Um, and again, this is just the tip of the, the issue on transportation. But God, we want to pray against racism in our transportation. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our, hear our prayers. prayers. And the last category I have listed is employment. African American workers still face more hurdles to get a job, never mind a good one, than their white counterparts. They continue to face systematically higher unemployment rates, fewer job opportunities, lower pay, poorer benefits, and greater job instability. These persistent differences reflect systemic barriers to quality jobs, such as outright discrimination against African-American workers, as well as occupational segregation whereby African-American workers often end up in lower paid jobs than whites and segmented labor markets in which black workers are less likely than white workers to get hired into stable, well-paying jobs. God, tonight we want to pray against this racism. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. Are there any other categories that you would like to add to our prayer tonight? God said, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. We pray against systemic racism and we pray against white supremacy culture. Uh, for justice and equity, but it seems like our voices are about whispers in the wind of such huge um, institutions, huge and powerful and established. And it feels um, to us like, does this, does this make a difference? Does it matter? But I heard a saying years ago that said, one whisper, added to thousands of other whispers can become a roar. So what we do here tonight in our prayers, what we do here tonight in um, taking a stand against racism and white uh, supremacy culture is but a whisper, but we add our whisper to all the other whispers that are happening and trust that God will make this into a roar. So let us close with prayer. God of heaven and earth, you created the one human family and endowed each person with great dignity. We want to pray against racism. We want to pray against white supremacy <clears throat> culture in all its forms. Aid us, we pray, in overcoming the sin of racism. The sin of systemic racism and white supremacy culture are so ingrained in our culture and in our lives that we often don't see it. And when we do, we feel helpless to change things. Please continue to open our eyes to this sin and guide us to a better way of equity and justice. Please heal our land. Please heal us of the sin of racism in all forms. We lift up our prayers to your love and to your light, asking for the power of your Holy Spirit to help, to heal, to restore us and society to the way you created us to be, the, to your will, to your dream for humanity, to your love for all. Grant us your grace in eliminating this blight from our hearts and from our communities, our social and civil institutions. Fill our hearts with love for you and our neighbor so that we may work with you joining in your kingdom work in healing our land from racial injustice, 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 And I do want to put a, a claim on this, that some of this prayer came from the Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, mm. in part. Um, so any comments or reflections at this time? Yeah, I think that's very good. I, I, I mean, e even when we're talking about it again, I, I, I guess I kind of think, uh, what can we do or what can people do? But but I think this this has been perfect, is to sort of hand it off to God. And, and maybe we should just wait and see if he answers these prayers or maybe he'll lead us in a different direction. I'm not sure exactly, but but I think you're right. I think praying about it is very important. The um, scripture passage for the lectionary this week is the vine and the branches. And um, as I was studying for that to, uh, sermon today, um, what I was reading is our job is to stay connected to the vine right. and God will you know, continue to guide us and, and bring fruit out of our lives. So I think you're right, Dan, we need to stay connected to God because if we had the answers, we would do something, right? Exactly. Something yeah. more than what yes, we're you're right about that, right? There was a, <clears throat> a book I read many years ago uh, called you know, Prophet. And it was a book, it was an extraordinarily conservative novel written by a Christian writer. And I didn't really agree with much of anything that was in it, except for the, this concept. Uh, this newscaster had a, had a very strong uh, view that uh, he, he wanted to describe on the air uh, in relationship to a news story that he had investigated and developed. And because it was an unpopular thing he was, it basically was cut at the end of the newscast. And so what he did was, is at the end of that, he uh, sat in the, uh, in the newsroom and just read the story. I mean, there were no cameras on, there, was, there were no lights on, everything was shut down, but he read the story all by himself out loud, like he was on the air. And that really kind of moved me, not because I agreed with what he was saying, but because it, it occurred to me that sometimes when we speak the word or the words of truth, uh, just saying them gives them power. They have, they have power of their own, separate and apart from us. And once they're said, they're, they're never unsaid. And so um, meeting like this in a small group and saying these things uh, those words are out there now, and they have power, and they might make a difference in ways that we can't even imagine. Um, and so I think that that it's, you know, it's one of my favorite things is uh, that one of my favorite prayers is it's in our Book of Common Worship. Uh, and it says, you know, God, uh, hear our prayers and give us the ability to help you answer them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all, That's we a don't great prayer for tonight. We yeah, that is. Yeah. We're, supposed to, we're supposed to ask for God's inspiration to us so that we can make our prayers uh, answered the way we want them to be answered. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe somebody could tell me the, right now I'm blanking out on the Christian singer who, uh, contemporary singer who's in his song is, um, uh, I, I was you know, crying out to God, why don't everything's such a mess? Why don't you do something? And 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 the tag is I did, I sent you. Yeah. Or I created you. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. I just can't think of who it is that sings it right now. But it's kind of that's kind of the thing. It's like God, why don't you do something? And he's saying, Well, I did. I created you. Go ahead, do it. I think I grew up always believing in the power of one too. So I think, you know, that one with God and, and just one can make a difference. And I think I've had, you know, examples of that in my life that makes me think that, you know, you, you, you can do it. And that's, I guess it's the best way to say it. I talk a lot about my mom, but I don't know if I shared my brother's story. He worked as a laborer in JNL Steel and, um, uh, back in the 60s, 70s, 60s. And 
he noticed that, you know, if there were any opportunities, they were always, all the, the guys, the black guys were always laborers. They were always passed over. So he raised a funk in JNL still. And he went to the union people and he protested and he just, you know, he got under their skin and he went to labor meetings and he just, pro, you know, just the force of one decided that you, you just, this isn't legal. You can't keep doing this. I will bring down the wrath. And um, mm -hmm. they, they changed things. They, they put together programs so that, and he and his friends and others were able to take part in a training program that, and my brother was dyslexic. He could not read. And he became a metallurgist in the mill, testing a spark tester and testing steel through this program that he fought very hard to make happen. So, you know, I guess I come from a family that you can do it, whatever it is, you put your mind to it, just go out there and do it, you know? So I, I just think that when I, when I say to you all that you have the power and, you know, you have the will, wherever you see the opportunity to make change, just do it. I think that's what that's what stands out for me is that you, that we can do it. That God is standing beside us when we try. So, Denise, I think when I get to the other side, I'm going to ask to meet your mom. She's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. been an extraordinary woman. <laughs> have two two children that have done so so much, uh, and and are passing it on. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this now over to Cassie. So I am talking and praying on the racism that's in us, how we fight against it, how we fight against the white supremacy that we have been ingrained with. How many times have we heard the phrase, I'm not racist, I have a black friend or a black coworker, or a black grandchild. Maybe we ourselves have been the ones to utter this phrase. I know that I have. My sister's niece, my daughter's best friend, I pray that she never hears me say her name like a pawn in the I'm not racist Olympics ever again. We need to be better. Our friends and our neighbors and loved ones, they deserve better. People of color aren't tokens or trophies to be used and pulled out when it's convenient and then put back on a shelf when it isn't. If you genuinely want to be a friend, listen. Listen to your black loved ones and neighbors when they describe the pain or trauma that is endured. Listen to the fear or the anger Practice being able to say something like Black Lives Matter without feeling the need to interject that all lives matter, because of course they do. Let me summarize Luke 15. There are a hundred sheep, but one goes missing. Jesus leaves the 99 and goes after the one. The 99 might say, but what about us? Don't we matter? Of course the 99 still matter. And of course Jesus loves them too, but they're not the ones in danger. The one is. Our black and brown siblings need us to do the work right now in ourselves. We as white people, we are so entrenched in racist ideology that we don't always see our privilege for what it is. That does not mean that our lives are necessarily easy. It just means that the color of our skin does, is not one of the things that makes life more difficult. We need to listen. When people kneel, we need to listen. When people march, we need to listen. If people riot, we need to listen. Martin Luther King Jr., whose hatred of violence was visceral, said riots are the language of the unheard. How many of us have seen or shared, maybe said ourselves something along the lines of this movement? I wouldn't listen, I would listen if they didn't riot. But a lot of people didn't listen. And for far too long, we didn't listen. 
And honestly, a lot of it has been blown out of proportion to the good measures that are being done and taken. Cops who use too much force are beginning to be held accountable and we need to pray that that continues to happen. The plight of systemic racism is being brought to the limelight and we need to continue to pray that that will lead to lasting change. These are important steps, but they are baby steps. So what can we do? How can we fight our own intrepid racism? Pray for justice, pray for police accountability, pray for change. Those are important things, prayer. That's why we're here, so important for us to do. Before sharing on social media, research. Make sure what you were posting is true and accurate. Listen and educate yourself, something that we are doing here and now. There are so many ways to learn from Netflix shows to children's books, documentaries to podcasts, even just an open and honest conversation. If you'll feel called and led, come join a rally or demonstration. There was somebody who mentioned in a prayer group the other day, I'm too old to do that. No, you're not. Come sit and hand out water bottles. Come have a conversation with somebody who is way smarter than me at some of these rallies. You'll learn so much. And if anybody would like the social media information to be able to follow, I'd be happy to pass that along. If you hear or see racism, even unintentional racism, call it out. Something as simple as people calling the recent trial, the George Floyd trial. It wasn't the George Floyd trial. He was murdered. He didn't get to go to trial. Chauvin was on trial. Don't let your racist coworker keep making the same comment about if they have nothing to hide, then they have nothing to worry about, right? Adam Toledo was a 13 year old boy, a Latino young boy. He had his hands up at the time that he was shot dead. He was not a threat and he was shot dead by police. A story like so many of our black and brown siblings. And as a reminder, it is not the police's job to continuously be jury and executioner. At the end of our prayer vigil tonight, we will be listening to a song from the movie version of the play Hairspray. This song comes during a peaceful march to end racial segregation. Tracy Turnblad, the main character, is a TV dancer, a position she fought really hard for. She chooses to march in solidarity with her black siblings in Christ. You're gonna pay a heavy price, Motor Mouth Mabel says. You'll never dance on TV again. She just responds, if I can't dance with seaweed and little Inez, then I don't wanna dance at all. Tracy knows that by marching and standing up to her friends for what is right, it could cost her quite a bit, including her career but she does it anyways because it is the right thing to do. She is being a true white ally here, putting the needs and the rights of her black loved ones before her own comfort. Coming back to real life, Dr. Chick at Xavier University wrote after George Floyd's murder, I am not Derek Chauvin. No one I know is Derek Chauvin. No one I know would deliberately attack someone physically, verbally, emotionally, due to the color of his or her skin. Neither I nor anyone I know would discriminate against or attack someone because of the color of their skin. Neither I nor the people I know would ever do this or would ever allow this to happen. Or would we? Or do we? And then I got to thinking further. Yes, I know I'm not Derek Chauvin, but I am like the two officers who restrained Mr. Floyd or the third officer who stood by and did nothing while George Floyd was murdered. What have I done by my action or inaction? How often have I taken for granted my own comfort and privilege when I should have been trying to change a system, a culture that allows for this injustice, both covert and overt, against people of color to continue. 
I think of Philippians 2 here. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Do not or value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. I pray that we are able to put our own selfishness aside and be more like Jesus, humble, caring for the interests of those who are hurting and listening to fighting for the oppressed. As Motormouth Mabel sings later in the song, just to sit still would be a sin. Let us keep doing the work. Please pray with me. Lord, help us as we strive to find our way to true racial justice. Open our eyes to all that goes on around us that contribute to racial injustice. Grant us the knowledge to understand that what we do, both personally and as a society, which prevents us from recognizing and defending the dignity of all of our siblings, and especially at this time, our siblings of color who are feeling so much pain. Grant us the grace to reflect on our own actions and inactions that contribute to this pain. And grant us the strength to take action to alleviate this pain and to end racial injustice in all its forms. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cassie. Any reflections on uh, her? Oh. I think it's very poignant and I think it's very honest. Uh, and I also think it's very true. Uh, you know, we we all we all carry our own um, racist baggage with us that was, you know, very carefully ingrained in us when we were small children, uh, and uh, and and we need to notice it, and we need to see it, and we need to confess it, uh, and seek forgiveness for it. Um, so. Yeah, Cassie, you're right. Thank you for speaking truth for all of us. Yeah. You give me hope. <laughs> <laughs> There's my model. <laughs> there she is. Picture perfect as always. Look at you. May, may like the food a better just world left me. Absolutely. Yeah. Wait, where's dad? Yeah, dad, 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 dad just walked away with the food. What is this? <laughs> Oh, but thank you, Cassie. Thank you, thank you Cassie. And th at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. I want to uh, preface what I'm saying is that I recognize that uh, there are um, very heightened emotions among uh, folks of like minds, of which we all are about the, the deaths that have occurred uh, in people of color at the hands of the police over the last uh, certainly year and a half and well beyond that. Uh, but I wanted to also offer uh, a prayer uh, for the police. Uh, and, and I'll explain why I wanna do that. But first I wanna read a little bit of scripture uh, because I think it's important to base you know many, much of what we say on scripture. And it comes from uh, the gospel according to Matthew, and it's from the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, um, Jesus is, to, is speaking. Uh, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even the tax, uh, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? 
Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And there's actually many different parts of the Sermon on the Mount that could be applicable here. And we need to recognize that. Uh, in, well, let me, let me just do this. I, I, Tony Norman is somebody I like to read. And Tony Norman wrote an editorial this morning. And uh, I took the opportunity to pick out, I cherry picked out of it, I admit that. Uh, and I think that uh, it's important to hear some of the things that were in his uh, editorial that strike me as important. Um, let me just read what I cherry picked out of it. Uh, as recent reports from across the country have amply demonstrated, a lot of cops enter a domestic disturbance expecting the worst. That's, what they that's why they come in hot and scared, regardless of their years on the force. A cop's automatic assumption is that everyone is armed, so everyone is in a position to kill them. They're not mental health experts, marriage counselors, or drug addiction specialists. At best, they're badly trained sociologists with guns. They're also ordinary people who are barely holding it together in their own lives. They sublimate their own fear and anger issues as best they can because that's what's expected of them. Life and death depends on their perception of a person's ability to comply with shouted orders, even the contradictory ones. They arrive at scenes already pulsing with bedlam, crosstalk and threats of violence. They're trained to scan for sudden movement and to counter it with overwhelming force. Most cops, no matter how personally friendly, reasonable, and inclined they are to serve the public good, aren't sufficiently trained for many of the duties imposed on them by society. That's not fair to them or society. It is clear from monitoring police online comment boards that many are psychologically ill-equipped to deal with people who don't look like them. That's why Black folks would be immensely better off not calling the cops in cases that don't involve child abuse, imminent assault, murder, burglary, and other violent crimes. Instead of calling the cops, they should call a growing list of professionals and volunteers in the community providing alternative services. There are plenty of alternatives to calling the cops for everything from domestic violence to substance abuse to problems with teenagers who may have cognitive or behavioral issues. Until American policing is restructured and reconstituted to serve the needs of ordinary citizens, Black Americans and those disproportionately penalized for calling 911 for help should look to alternative services. The entire community will be better off as a result of less frequent contact with the police. Mm. I think that's truth. I think that's prophetic. Uh, and one of the reasons I believe that is because I think one of the tremendous problems we have with the police in America today is that we don't use them right. And in fact, we, in some respects, abuse their uh, abilities because they aren't trained to do much of what we ask them to do. Uh, they aren't selected uh, in a way that puts them into a position where they are competent to deal with the general public and the problems that are presented to them when someone calls 911. Uh, and that's really important because we've all been in, we've all had the experience of being asked to do something, agreeing to do it because we thought it would be nice to do or something we want to do, and then later finding out that we haven't been trained to do it and aren't in fact competent to do it. And so we fail. And that's what's happening with the police right now. Uh, many of the police officers involved in these circumstances should not be police officers, have not been adequately trained to be police officers, and are not trained to be competent to deal with the problems that have been presented to them when they go to these places. Their reaction is, we're going to go in and we're going to pull our guns, we're going to tell people to stop what they're doing, and then we're going to haul off the people we think uh, have started the problem. But that is not the only possible answer to these circumstances. There needs to be the ability to de-escalate. There needs to be the ability for people to recognize that just because a teenager is out of control, that's not a reason to call the police. Just because, as one of the things I didn't include in this was, just because someone is walking naked down your street screaming that the aliens are company, coming is not a reason to call the police. Uh, the police aren't well suited 
to deal with that issue, with those issues. And so my, what my prayer is that uh, all of these issues that raised, raised by Tony Norman be addressed uh, and that we can fix uh, the way we select police and the way we train them and the way we use them uh, because we're never, we, we need them. We need them. And every day they go out there and they never know when they're going to be dead that day because of something bizarre that happens uh, that they cannot predict. Uh, and so they're important to us and we need to keep them in prayer as well uh, because even though there are bad ones, there are Derek Chauvin's out there, and there are the others who, who act in horrible and racist ways. Uh, there are also a lot of them out there that do not agree with that and that we need to support so that they can push those bad cops out and bring in the new cops who are competent, who are unbiased, and who are well-trained. And so that's what I wanted to say. I mean, we just can't, we cannot forget that, that there are these, there, these people are out there trying to help us, the vast majority of them. And even though we have seen such terrible things happen over the last few years with regard to the police, we need to support them, support those who do it right and, and try to, to make it and try to police us in a, just, in a way that demonstrates justice. And so I offer a prayer. Will you pray with me, please? Blessed are you, Lord God of mercy, who through your son gave us a marvelous example of charity and the great commandment of love for one another. Send down your blessings on our police, your servants, who so generously devote themselves to helping others. Grant them courage when they are afraid, wisdom, when they must make quick decision, strength when they are weary, and compassion in all their work. When the alarm sounds and they are called to aid both friend and stranger, let them faithfully serve you and their neighbors. We pray that they be trained well and that their talents not be misused by requiring them to manage situations outside their competence. We pray for their safety. We pray for their hope. We pray for their ability to suppress bias. We pray for their faith. We pray for purity of heart and dedication to their call. We pray that they remain calm in all encounters. We pray for the ones who would do them harm, but those who do are unsuccessful. We ask that you bless them and keep them, that you let your face shine on them, and that you be gracious to them, and so that we can all have peace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Any reflections for on Jeff's presentation? I do. So first, let me say that I sit on a public safety committee um, and our purpose is in one of the communities is to help the police become more socially acceptable in the community. And I sit on that with police officers. And um, so the work there has just begun. Um, one of the things that came out uh, in a discussion, we were in small group and I was in with one of the officers and we were discussing how they could be seen more positively in the community. And his reaction was, well, if we get rid of the bad element, then we'll be more positive. And I'm like, that's not what we're here for. The bad element is there. It's, it's going to be there. It's there in every community. But how you respond to that element and everyone else in the community is why we're here. So that you don't see everybody and every face as the bad element because we're not all the bad element. Um, I think in the piece that you read, Jeff, one of the things that kind of struck me hard 
was that he said the black community should not call them for frivolous reasons. And I know you didn't put it that way, but we should look to other measures. But what was interesting that is that he said that for the black community, not all of society. Like if we're going to do it, then we should all do that. It shouldn't be selective groups that have relegated to, well, you can call the police, but you can't, you shouldn't, because you already know how they're going to react when they come. Trust me, we already know how they're going to react. There are a lot of Black women who suffer domestic violence because rather than call the police while they're getting beat, they know what the reaction will be. They don't want that guy dead because he's beating on them. And we go in and clean up the aftermath of that. So I think we're very much aware of not calling them in all situations. That's something that that's almost ingrained. Like you, you just don't call them because you, you don't know what the outcome will be. So I think that that's fair, fairly common with us. Um, so I do have, you know, that statement to make like, okay, I agree. We should have better trained police officers. We should have officers that don't see you know, and, and, I, and I know it's absolutely a tough job. It's the only job, in, it's one of the few jobs in the world that your job is to put your, your life on the line every day. It's a very tough place to be. None of us want to be in that, in that predicament. And I agree with you that they need more distinct training that, you know, that they need to, to recognize how to respond. And we need to have alternatives um, for everybody, for every situation so that we do are able to call, you know, social workers when social workers are called for, um, or, you know, drug and alcohol counselors, if that's what's called for, or mental health professionals, or, you know, crisis management people. Um, that is one of the reasons why people are saying dismantle the police force is not dismantle the police force and, and, and those who are enforcing the law as much as augment it so that you have those kind of choices available to you. I'm a nine to five social worker. You can call me after five o'clock. You might get a headache kind of greets me. You know, <laughs> you know I'm not going to want to go out there and say, okay, let's see what's going on here. Let's assess the situation. You know, so maybe they need to have social workers that are sitting at the police station 24 seven and somebody else could that they could respond with them or they can assess the situation if it's a drug and alcohol situation that's what people are looking at is to is to create a, a, a more diverse police force that responds to all calls no matter the community in a much more divergent way that really responds to what the needs are and, and in some cases sometimes you know like if it's a life and death matter, then I, I agree. They, they, they're the ones that put their lives on the line. And, and I wholeheartedly support the work that they do because we do need them. Unfortunately, we're not kind to each other. But I think that we have to look at systems that work for everyone, not just one set of people, but everyone, because that's what's needed. And it's hard. I think that's hard. That's going to be a tough job. You know, I, I, I think I told Judy, I said, you know, the guy that killed all the Asians walked out with a scratch on his leg. How does that happen? How does that happen? You know, when, when we have a fake $20 bill and we're dead, how does that happen? That's a different response. That's what we see. That's how we see it. You know, we, I don't know how else to explain that to anyone. Like that, 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 that's the kind of response that makes it hard that we don't want to call the police for anything. We would rather, you know, handle it ourselves, get broken, beat up, whatever it takes, just to avoid those kind of situations. That's all I have to say. I'm sorry. Thank you, Denise. That was very well. But. all you had to say that was <laughs> awesome mm -hmm. i'm sitting over here like preach <laughs> <laughs> but and you bring the um from any, oh, i'm so sorry diane oh well i was just going to say you bring the experience from your background too so there's the weight of what you say 
And what you say makes perfect sense. Why not have people who are adjunct, who are uh, social workers, who are psychologists, who are um, de-escalators, people who negotiate in hostage situations. There are people who do that. Mm -hmm. um, people who can roll out and are, are trained when, when they should step back and get out of the way and when they should um, be on call. And, you know, okay, your turn to de-escalate before some, some thing happens that absolutely did not have to happen at all. And having, having to um, re-educate people for years of why should we believe any different? Well, why should you? You know, why should you believe any different? So that's a lot. That's a process that's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's a matter of earning trust, not not the people who are calling the police or who don't want them in the community. But those people must the police and whoever must demonstrate that trust is earned. Mm -hmm before trust can be given. And that's only a logical thing when you think of everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want you want someone to be to demonstrate that they're trustworthy first before you allow them into yourself. So it, it to me it's logical. It's just a logical process for it to happen. I think the the things like 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 you know like Jeff was saying about having a social worker in a social work position and and this is another one of those tragic stories is I had a friend who lives in the UK where a young lady suffered with depression and um, the police found her by the bridge and you know asked her caught her before she jumped said what are you doing here go home took her home and never thought to find any kind of mental health services for her at all. Three days later, she was back on that same bridge and she jumped and she died. Like, what if they had taken her to the hospital instead? What if they had taken her to a, middle, you know, a family member? What if they had done something just a little bit different to assess the situation and really determine what was needed? She died as a result. Uh, I don't want to say they didn't care, but they just really didn't know how to respond. And she, she's not here, you know, and that's, I mean, that's a poignant case for me as much as, you know, some of the other things. It was like, wow, nobody thought to take her to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought to do that. Like, you know, most of the time you think people, 302 of them, you know, if you see somebody stand on the bridge ready to commit suicide or looking like they're contemplating it, don't you us automatically take him to the hospital? I didn't understand that, you know. And I knew when she, like, I got the news when she, when she died, and and then to find out like three days before they could have prevented it, it was just totally amazing to me. And it just speaks to the fact that we need more. I agree with Jeff. We do need more. We need better responses to situations than what we have now on both sides, on every side. The entire police system needs to be restructured. I mean, when I'm out marching with all of these people and they're, you know, saying defund the police and all that, it's not get rid of the police entirely. It's this whole system is broken. It's a broken system that until it gets restructured, there is not going to be a lasting change. Accountability is one thing. And the fact that accountability is starting to happen more and more is wonderful, but there's not, it, it's not gonna change until, and, and that's for the cops as well. They are overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they are underprepared. They're getting calls for suicides, for homeless people, for mental health disorders, for naked people running down the street singing that they're not prepared or know how to handle. There needs to be social workers, chaplains on the 
police force or whatever it ends up becoming, that people can call to get help an 811, a 311, 911 for emergencies, 811 for mental health emergencies. There needs to be a change to the system because the way it stands right now, there isn't going to be a difference. The police need to be trained in doing their job, which is going in and yes, they are putting their lives on the line and they need to be able to be taught how to de-escalate a situation, take care of their racial bias because why would a bomber walk away with a scratch on his leg while George Floyd is murdered for a counterfeit $20 bill? But the entire system is a problem. It needs to be changed. Thank you all for honest, some honest conversation. And Jeff, thank you. Obviously, the topic is important. And uh, thank you for um, being the, the one to input that into our, our prayers tonight. And, and uh, it seems like such a strange note to turn this over to Denise, <laughs> who, who's... who's <laughs> part in this is hope. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I said, I, I still have hope. I still do. Absolutely, I do. And I think, you know, one of my favorite passages, and you will remember, is Judy, is Isaiah. I love Isaiah 40, um, 29. He says, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So that is one of my favorite passages ever, because that is absolutely, to me, the hope, hope for all of us is that, you know, God is there. He will give us what we need when we need it. And that we don't have to to depend on ourselves. Thank God we don't have to depend on ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asked um, to do the part because I said I'm always hopeful. And I think one of the most hopeful things I've heard this year was the poet poem um, that was read at the inauguration um, uh, for uh, Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I chose to read her poem, which is beautiful. Um, and I'll start with this, Mr. President and Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President and Mr. Imhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but this doesn't mean we're striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to form our union with purpose to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so that we can reach our arms out to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. 
that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, because, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is a promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It is a path we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it. We destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be perfect, permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but it, within it, we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So leave, let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. Every breath, with every breath from our bronze pounded chest, we will raise the wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold lined hills of the West. We will rise from the wind swept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile and recover in every nook of our nation in every corner are called our country, our people, diverse and dutiful will emerge battered but beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. That's the end. Thank you, Amanda Gorman. <laughs> Love that poem so much. Me too. When I heard it, when I heard it live, I jumped up and yelled, "Woohoo!" <laughs> <laughs> that's what it. That was. That's one of the best I've ever heard. She's Love wonderful. It. Yes. Love yes. It. Thank you for um, bringing us that hope at the end of this, but um, for also being hope for us, Denise. Oh yeah. I don't know any other way. I keep thinking, as long as God is on his throne, there's hope for us all. And he's still sitting there. He's still, he's still in control of all of this mess. <laughs> well, I think this was far more powerful than I could have even imagined uh, yeah. tonight. Um, so thank you all for being here. And we um, hope to share this video so others will be able to experience this as well. And, but we do wanna close with, um, Cassie, are you able to do the video, I Know Where I Have Been by Queen Latifah?
Tracy! You're gonna pay a heavy price. I know. You never dance on TV again. If I can't dance with seaweed and little Inez, then I don't want to dance on TV at all. I just want tomorrow to be better. There's a light in the darkness Though the night is black as my skin There's a light burning bright Showing me the way But I know Thank you all for being here. And what was the quote that you had, Jeff? May God hear our prayers and guide us into being part of the answer. Yes. Something to that effect. Uh, may, may God hear our pray prayers. May God bless us and may God allow us to be part of the answers. Thank you all for being on this journey. Thank you all for being here tonight. God bless. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good night. Good night, night everybody. <laughs>